This is Anarchast. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast. I'm super excited, a guy I've read for many years. He's I've never actually met him in person and I was really thrilled and I'm so glad that he came to uh, do an Anarchist video with us, uh, Jeffrey Tucker. <laughs> I like the name Anarchist, that's really great. Oh, you didn't like even know. No, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just two typical anarchists visiting at, uh, at a convention. Yes, right. yes, and trying not to cause too much problems. <laughs> um, and uh, you're also with uh, Lazy Fair Books now? I am. I'm the executive editor of Lazy Fair Books. I've been, since, been there since uh, November 1st, 2011, and we're trying to make a business. Great. And I always ask every first guest on Anarchist is, yeah. uh, how did you become an anarchist? <laughs> well, um, hmm. so I was, I guess, like most people, a believer in sort of so-called minimal government for a long time. Like, oh, well, we can't have a system where there's no government at all. You know? right. And then it just like, dawned on me one day. Uh, that Murray was right, I, and I was friends with Murray during this period. He had a big influence, Murray Rothbard had a big influence over me personally. Right. And, and I thought, well, he's a little bit dangerous with this whole anarchism thing, but uh, I'll go along with him, there's so much to learn from him. And then one day I just realized that there was nothing wrong with the society that the government could improve. And it just kind of snapped. I thought, you know, everything government does that needs to be done can be done by the market better, and there's nothing government can do to what's wrong with society to improve over the present situation. And so I, I changed. And then over time you realize that anarchism is just embedded in the structure of social life. I mean, we, look, we conduct our lives in a state of anarchy all the time. And by which I mean we're orderly. Um, we don't uh, have master-slave relationships. We seek out mutually, mutual benefit one with, the, one with another, you and I together, and every other person on the planet. So uh, to the extent that there's peace and there's prosperity, it, it indicates the presence of a beautiful form of anarchy. So that's it. You know, don't you think it's important for people to get rid of the idea of the state? I mean, for, for, the, for the purpose of intellectual development. I mean, it's a freeing up that takes place. And once you rid yourself of the myth of the state, everything becomes possible. Yeah, it certainly cleared things up for me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's like Stefan Molyneux, you said, we talked about this the other day, uh, if you have the Earth at the center of the solar system, uh, you have to keep coming up with crazy and crazier yeah. laws and ideas yeah. to, to make it all work, because all of a sudden Mars now goes backwards, and so we need new formulas. But as soon as you just put the Sun at the center of the solar system, it's all very simple. And right. as soon as you uh, take non-aggression and make it that as your sole principle at yeah. the center of, of what we are, yeah. everything is simple. Yeah. And for me, you know, I came, became convinced that anarchism works, that anarchy works. It's practical. It makes our lives beautiful. It's the source of all beauty in the world. I mean, all the wonderful things we see around us came about because of a mutually beneficial exchange. I mean, that's, that's what makes the world uh, productive and lovely. So, and I agree with you. Um, uh, I think changing to an anarchist outlook is really the beginning of a wonderful life adventure. It doesn't matter what, it doesn't mean you have to sit around and write books about anarchism. It might mean that you decide to open up a ballet studio. Or like me, I conduct a choir. Okay, but you begin to see the beauty of the orderliness of human interaction all around you. And that gives you hope. It certainly does, yes. I've got lots of hope. Yeah. Um, uh, that should lead me to another question. Uh, what's your hope that we, that more people, of course we're here at Freedom Fest, a yeah. lot of people agree with us here, but if you go out to that studio in the casino, there's a lot of people who have no idea what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, what's your hope, to we, will we have uh, more of those people who are out there in the casino understand what we're talking about in the future, or is it gonna take generations? Or? Yeah, I wish I knew for sure. You know, I think, you know, one thing that's really interesting to me uh, these days with young people and the way they use technology. Mm -hmm. Most people, young people are used to living more intensely in this world of anarchism. I mean, the, the app economy, there's no government agency running that, and that's perfectly obvious. I mean, to what extent is any young person uh, grateful to government for anything? Mm. You know, we went through Good generations point. where people believed that the government were given us cool things like right. moonshots, you know, oh, and uh, highways, and oh, they saved us, you know, and here's this dam that was built by the state, and, <laughs> and they're protecting from our retirement. That was then. This Now the state is really different. The, the state mostly consists of this apparatus that takes things from us. 
It's always been that, but now it's, it's more, more overt. Yeah. It's more obvious, isn't it? <laughs> they don't build dams and, and pave roads anymore. They don't do anything. They don't go to the moon, or whatever. All well, that stuff is from stupid. All their yeah. Socialism. And also, the theory of the state has changed. In the old days, the state uh, pretended to give us progress, like right. they would bring electrification to our rural communities <laughs> and things like this, right? No more. <laughs> now it's like stop drinking that Coca Cola. <laughs> don't smoke that Tazy. pot. <laughs> yeah, Tazy. Pepper hey, and let's, let's let me just mention something else since you mentioned that. One of the coolest changes in the world of libertarianism that I've experienced in my life in the last say ten or fifteen years. Nowadays, it's in the old days. Um, people who believe in liberty always made an exception for the police. Well, the police are more or less essential. The thin blue line between us and you know uh, disorder and chaos. Nowadays, almost all libertarians understand the police are not our friends. I mean, it's just, this is a dramatic change between now and, say, the 1980s. It's a big difference. And even the 1990s, no libertarian now likes the police. In fact, the police have become the symbol of oppression. That was not true in the past. That is a gigantic shift and an important one. You yeah. know, if we could privatize one thing first, mm. I, th I think it should be the courts and the and the police and and uh, the institutions of so-called justice. Yes. That's more important to privatize than anything else. The minarchists are exactly wrong. Those aren't the things to save. No, those are things that should go first. Yes, well, they're too important to yeah. leave in the hands of government. <laughs> and it, interesting you say courts. There's a n number of private arbitration systems that are popping up all over the place. Judge.me.com or judge.me. Um, I'm and glad you mentioned that. Yeah, and that was started by an anarcho-capitalist. As oh, many of the newest technologies are. My friend David Vexler, who used to be my webmaster, um, has invented a new cryptography system for sending instant messages that are encrypted. These, these are kind of anarchists that are giving us new technologies and new cool things to, to do. I mean, they're changing the world, mm -hmm. especially through commerce. Judge me is amazing. And Bitcoin. Bitcoin Very is great. Very interesting, <laughs> exciting, and many other things are going to be coming along too. Totally. That's sort of uh, some of the hope I have too, is yeah. the government, you know, the technology, it's sort of a race right now between the government and us and this technology and who can take advantage of it to like either oppress ourselves or, or uh, free ourselves. Well, I hope and you're right that it's a race because we will win. I think so too. I'm, yeah. I'm quite optimistic. I'm very optimistic. And uh, part of the reason is they come out with all these drones now. There's millions of 13-year-old boys around the world who can hack those things and send them back to Washington, D.C. <laughs> the skies will darken and it will be beautiful. Yeah. And we'll just get rid of those guys. But uh, yeah, so I'm very optimistic. But I want to go back just briefly because we didn't get into too much about uh, your past. You yeah. said you knew Murray Rothbard. Yeah, very well. And so what, uh, what time period was that? Uh, I met him, let me think for a second, just one second. He died in 1995. So I suppose I met him in... Uh, 1985. Can that be right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess I knew him for a solid 10 years. And how uh, did you meet him? Through, I met him at a conference. Uh, it was an investment conference, actually, the first time I met him. Uh, and um, uh, it, was just, it was intriguing. Uh, to You expect this kind of scary giant, and said he was this very uh, sort of short and happy, uh, jolly man. Very expansive. And, he was very interesting because we spent you know, a lot of time together and he would do this with everybody because he was interested in everything. Whatever you were interested in, he was interested in. He's wow. a funny kind of person in that way. So it was very flattering to be with him <laughs> because he wanted to talk about the stuff you cared about. He would never just sit you down and go, well, you don't know anything about what I'm telling you, but I'm going to teach you. No, he wasn't really like that. He wanted to find out what you knew so he could get that information from you and have a good conversation. But what was weird about it, about being with Murray, is whatever topic you knew about, um, it was not entirely likely that you knew more about that topic than Murray did. And <laughs> if you did, he would find out very quickly and, and couldn't wait to learn from you. That's the way he was to wow, be well, with. Well, that's how most smart people are. <laughs> yeah, you're right. They actually listen to what people are saying. But it was very interesting because you get a lot of versions of Murray Rothbard. You talk to people who knew him. Oh, really? Everybody has a different version of who he was and what he did. And the reason was, that um, because we're all different people and Murray was really good at finding out who you were and uh, what you knew and how to talk to you as an individual. He's an individualist, I guess you could say, but a fascinating personality to be around. I mean, brilliant beyond belief. He read everything. He read everything. He was a speed reader. And oh, really? I had the chance to, not speed reader is not the right, it was like, an, a, like a speed extractor of information from books. Like he would sit on a bench and like, a book would be in front of him and he would just know what to look for and just chew it up and just, oh. And he would mark it, you know, as he read. 
I've never seen anything like it. Now, he was a fascinating person. He's a very broad-minded person, too. So he wasn't like just maniacally focused on politics. He was interested in theater and, the, and music. He used to take classes with his wife at Columbia University on, on the Baroque period and European music and architecture. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine? Wow. This is a man who knew how to... But in that way, he was a model anarchist. Mm. Because as an anarchist, he could care about everything, you know, and, <laughs> and he found he found anarchy in everything, you know. Uh, he, he loved Gothic architecture and the Baroque. Too. No, no, he didn't like Gothic. I like Gothic. He didn't <laughs> like Gothic. He liked the Baroque. You know why he liked the Baroque? Because in, in Baroque, the cathedrals all got filled with uh, images of humanity, mostly n naked images of humanity that emphasized humanity in the most intense sort of way. And so he liked that because he thought that the, the Gothic was a little too theocentric and he liked Baroque because it was a little more humanistic, you know. So he had all these theories on everything. Amazing person to be around. So yeah, he had a lot of influence on me. But I knew him for several years before I had fully come over to, to anarchism. Did you know that he used to, he would say things. I remember, um, I'd think, oh God, Murray, don't say that. It's just, people, polite people don't talk like that. I mean, that's just too radical. It's too scary. You know, you shouldn't say things like that. And it, sh it would shake me up, and I would have the impulse to want to edit his conversations. Like, God, Murray, I hope you don't tell somebody that in an interview. Like, he was in favor of legalization of drunk driving. I'd go, oh, for God's <laughs> sake, why is this genius saying such crazy things, you know? But he, he did say crazy things, but why? Because he wanted to dislodge you of whatever myths you held. Or at least, he wanted you to question things really fundamentally all the time. He wasn't playing games. He just never watched his tongue. I mean, he, he <laughs> yeah, was no willing filter. to, yeah, he was willing to think about anything and say anything, and uh, he wasn't afraid of what was true. I think that's great. We knew more people like yeah. him. So nowadays, everyone talks so politically correct. I know. It's, like, it's no wonder people are so unhappy. They're just, they're enslaved by the government. They enslave themselves through how they act and, and how they believe in these systems that really are just terrible based on violence and theft. And, yes. And, and they think they're the good ones and they call us the bad guys. And yeah. Everything's upside down. You know? Yeah. Um, did you know Ludwig von Mises? Pardon me? Did you know Ludwig von Mises? No, no, he died in 73, so I was, oh, okay. I was way too okay. young. Uh, but, uh, I mean, of course, you know, I've read all of his works, even before I went to, to work for the Mises Institute. Right. Um, so, but a very different figure from, from Rothbard. Mises was not an anarchist. Um, right. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, he would get right to the edge and pull back. And I think the reason was that he was kind of that part of that generation that I mean, he was he never wrote favorably about Hobbes, but I think Mises, like a lot of people, carry around that Hobbesian view. Mm. It's that sense that there's a there's a fear that people have that if we release that last little bit of the state, that everything's just gonna like fall apart, you know? And and maybe we don't know that we're kind of channeling Hobbes or that we're carrying Hobbes around with us. I mean Hobbes made all this all this stuff up. I mean he wasn't describing reality, he was describing the events of his country in a particular time and place. He thought that in absence of the state, the life would be brutal and nasty and short and all the rest of it. Well, you know, he was living in a time of relentless war over control of the state, you know, and it was a dreadful, a dreadful thing. So he thought in absence of the state, there were, no, in the presence of the state, there's war against all against all. I mean, so Hobbes had it exactly wrong. But anyway, so many generations of intellectuals absorbed that perspective. I think Mises was among them. Hayek, on the other hand, was not a Hobbesian. Temperamentally and his outlook on the world, he was, I would say, more anarchistic than Mises was, even though Hayek himself overtly embraced more of the kind of social planning apparatus, like he was in favor of, you know, like a minimal medical provision and all this crappy stuff. <laughs> but his theoretical outlook was, was, was fundamentally anarchistic in a way in which Mises is, was not. Anyway, I don't think libertarians in the future are going to hold on to the myth of minarchism. I think anarchism is deeply embedded in our world, don't you? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think, uh, you, you know the difference between a minarchist and an anarchist, right? No, tell me. Six months. <laughs> That's funny, yeah. As long as they're open-minded, right? Yeah. Unless they're gonna be closed-minded. That's but good, really, yeah. Well, uh, and I think the internet has helped a lot in this respect. Yes. Not just what people are reading, but also the experience of, of, of the world of liberty and the digital age. And it's I think so different. many people too are adding to the proof 
like we we can't prove it without actually doing it, actually living in a completely free right. society. People like Stefan Molyneux, yourself, every day you're showing people how it could work or would work or what even the philosophy behind it would be, and it just makes such perfect sense. Yeah, sure. But it I does. totally understand why a lot of people are scared because it is scary. We've never had a completely free world before. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, everyone's so indoctrinated and brainwashed with statism and from. 12 years of indoctrination yeah. camps and they go home they turn on the TV it's mostly just propaganda about the state and almost yeah, every yeah. country is like that too I live in Mexico and <laughs> it's, just, really, oh, yeah. it's just uh, oh the state is great the state is great yeah. the state is great but you know it's true and people say to me well we're never going to have an anarchist world so why do you bother well okay we're never going to have a world where there's no theft and there's no murder either <laughs> but we still you know we should work towards that <laughs> you know always yeah. I mean, the less theft and less murder there is in the world, the better a place it is. And so it seems very obvious to me, the more anarchism we have, the more orderly, beautiful, peaceful, uh, cooperatively productive and prosperous the world will be. You bring up some interesting points. Hayek wasn't an anarchist, Mises wasn't an anarchist, Ayn Rand wasn't an anarchist. Right. Is this a new thing? Is, anarchy, is it anarcho-capitalism, is anarchism I, like a really As an intellectual, thing? as a serious intellectual movement, yeah, it's relatively new, right? But Which is weird, isn't it? Freedom yeah. is, is a new idea. As an, as, as, an, <laughs> as, an, as an intellectual idea, to have a system worked out, yeah, I think it's relatively new. But you know, economics itself is a new science. I mean, it came about in the late Middle Ages. True. I mean, you can't read the ancients and discover much economic truth in them. Right. Uh, so you have to wait really essentially into the 15th, 16th century to begin to read serious economics. So since there's been a development, but you know, I think ideas progress as civilization progresses. The more, the more sophisticated, the more, more prosperous mm. we become, the, the yeah, more, the more we... Yeah, we all day so we can actually think about some yeah, that's things, right. and division we, of labor. That's right. And, and there was no real theory of money until there were sophisticated banking institutions that did things that cried out for explanation. <laughs> so now... Yeah, this is interesting. <laughs> now, now we're, we're living in a digital age. It's changed. Everything's different now. And it cries out for explanation. Mm. And so anarchism, the theory of anarchism is becoming ever more sophisticated just because the institutions that cry out for explanation are becoming ever more developed. Mm. Yeah, they're giving us lots of uh, material to talk about. Yeah, that's right, sure, that's right, that's right. And and I think one of the most important things that, uh, that, that libertarians need to get straight on in the future, and I'm afraid this is not entirely true for even the anarchists, is the issue of intellectual property. And, yes. and, and I don't want to you know, do this interview or complete it without mentioning that. <laughs> it's a very difficult topic, yes. but, but uh, Stefan Katsalis' brilliant monograph, The Bulger and the Vine, is a brilliant book on this topic. It's an important area to explore because mm -hmm. we're just at the beginning of research on it. And it's not just about copyright and patents. It's about the role of ideas in the building right. of society. Yes, I agree. Yeah. And that's always been one of the things that has been hardest for me to get my head around. I, I admit I don't even have my head fully around it. That's right. Uh, and, and so no it's good to hear from you. No, that, well, no oh, do I. So. I mean, it's a very difficult topic and it's, and it's, it's, it's mind-blowing, yeah. really. I mean, I, I, it's really a mistake for libertarians to think I know everything already. I've read everything. I've got a, I've got a completed system in my mind, and all I have to do is persuade people. There's always more things to research, always more to learn. And when I discovered this topic of of intellectual property, it opened totally new doors for me that I never thought I'd be walking through and seeing things I never thought I would see before. Sounds like you went on a trip. <laughs> I, I kind of did. I'm still on it. <laughs> I believe it. Well, it's been great to talk to you. Yeah, you have great energy good, yeah. about you, and uh, you do so much great work. And so, thank you very much for uh, being well with us. And maybe we can do this again sometime. I'd like to. Thank okay, you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. So it's Jeffrey Tucker, and this has been Anarchast, and that's all from Freedom Fest in Las Vegas. Peace, love, I like that. Peace. and anarchy.